Hi, I'm Brandy. And I'm Jen. And this is Keeping, Keeping It Simple. Hi, welcome to Keeping It Simple. This is episode six. And in today's episode, we are talking about the um, which is an ancient symbol seen in Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and Sumeria. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sorry it sounds like unk. it just sounds like unk. what did you say <laughs> um, so it's something that is often associated with Egyptians um but it actually does predate that and so we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit because there's I don't want to say controversy but there is question around whether or not what you see in Babylon and Sumeria is an, an onk or if it's something else right so and, and there's a lot of mystery with this this uh, symbol in general. Correct. And it's associated also with the key, the cross, and the knot. So that's a, a very interesting exchange between symbols and their meanings. And when we have something that can symbolically represent something else, which is a whole new layer to go into. So when it comes to Egypt, it's the crux on Sada. And it is essentially seen as the looped Tau cross. And it's the Nim Ankh or the key of life. Have you heard that before? Yes. Key of life, key okay. of denial. Yes. Yes. So here's one thing, because we're going to go down this little terror rabbit hole that I like to like dig into. So the Tau cross, right, is what we see on the hanged man. That is what the hanged man is hanging from is the Tau cross. Okay. When it comes to the Egyptians, the Tau cross or the monk is associated. One of the things they suspect, they don't actually know what it means, but one of the suspected things is that it is the division of and union of the male and female, essentially hermaphrodite right. to be both, right? And so my brain went, okay, so you have the hangman who is suspended on the Tau cross. And just to back up you, for anybody who doesn't know what that, it's essentially like a T-shape, correct? It's a T-shaped, yes. Right. It's a okay. T-shaped. And I meant to pull out my cards, um, but we can put that on the social. That's not the end sure. of the world, or you can drop it into the video. But you have the hanged man suspended on the Tau cross, right? And then you have the world card, which is the circle. If you were to put the world on top of the Tau cross, you have the Ankh. And in the middle of the world is the hermaphrodite, the union of the male and the female. So it's very much of that evolution from one to the other. This is interesting to me. And yes. you already know that they derived a lot of their symbolism from Egyptian mythology. Right. Well, they all derived a lot of their <laughs> mythology from Egyptian mythology, but the Golden Dawn specifically. Definitely. So that's interesting to me. Aside from male and female, um, this you know reconciliation of opposites and the integration of the active and the passive. What are what does the Ankh speak to you? What is is there any other thing that's like this or that? Well, I know we're going to get into some of those, but we, we'll talk more about the key because there is a lot of this key idea around what it being literally a key of life that imparts life, the breath of life. Um, there's also the mirror because that's yes. another interpretation of it as a hieroglyphic is that it was a mirror. Um, so we, yes. we can talk about some of those different associations a little bit deeper, but there's, oh, and then there was another one that believed, again, this is a mysterious one because there's, a, if you look at different historians, there's different takes on this. Um, another one is that it was the, the sun dawning basically. So you have the line of the Ankh and then there's that not part at the top the of that horizon, line. yeah. And that that's the sun coming up over the horizon, which in Egypt, the sun was a very important entity, if you will. Like it was, yes. the, they, they worshiped the sun. They worshiped, you know, that this solar energy that imparted nourishment crops, you know, and all that goodness. And that is, so you have that sun and you do, you have that heaven and earth convergence of both where, you know, people often, it's so funny to me because of somebody that works with spirit, right? There's this separation between heaven and earth. And I tell people all the time they're not separate they're right. interconnected in so many ways i like to say intermingling or co-mingling they are co-mingling with one another on a daily basis so it's very much about that merging of the two and also the macrocosm with the microcosm the human with their environment so it's not just between the two worlds but also 
just between the physical and what we can't see and what what are we a part of now what I love when it comes to this, because it's not associated with it all the time, but sometimes you get the Ouroboro or the luminescent mm -hmm. that it's, there's no end and no beginning because the original depictions, the earliest depictions they have of the Ankh is actually the bottom part is longer and it's two pieces. It's one. Oh, the two-legged one. Up. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. It's yeah. not actually a single piece. So it's very interesting because the way that they have it depicted, it's the two legs that separate, but the one piece. So it's, where's the end? Where's the beginning? And it's very cyclic in what we're talking about, male and female, masculine and feminine, heaven and earth, micro and macro. It's kind of like, there's no separation. There's no right. degree of, yeah, it's, it's kind of all interwoven, which often ties into a knot when we think of woven a woven knot like the knot of isis <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah and it is because it, so it's associated with gods and kings and isis um and it the way that you see it on reliefs in, in egypt is they talk about being able to command the power of the ankh but they are immortal themselves right so it is that that ebb and flow um the lack of the beginning and the lack of the end and so most people who've seen it, um, and you kind of said it earlier, because you talked about the breath of life. And if you see it in reliefs, they hold the onk up, the loop side to the nose. Mm -hmm. So why are they holding it up to the nose? Because they're imparting the breath of life, which is essentially that once somebody has passed in these funerary rites in Egypt, they believe the afterlife was a whole nother world. So they believe you absolutely went on, your soul went on, your life went on in just a different way. So imparting, so usually it was a god, one of the major gods like Horus or somebody like that, that would be shown, depicted in the art, holding that ankh up to the mouth of the deceased to impart the breath of life again into that new uh, afterlife. Is that, is, do and you it, feel like that's correct? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. That and that's, and that's, so when they talk about that, it's interesting because it is, a, it's literally that breath of life, that elixir of immortality and the way that they hold it, because most people, when they think of the Ankh, it's being held by the loop, mm -hmm. but when they're imparting it to somebody through the breath of life, it's the loop that's held to the nose. And we know the nose is significant in Egypt, which is why they did, you know, everything through the nose, through unfortunately, the nose. <laughs> like they're moving the brain. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is, it's very much like opening taking it as a key and opening the realm of eternity or immortality. So it's, it's that breath, but I mean, and you literally think of like opening a gate, it's very much, yes. and it's through that, the nostrils. So one of the things that I always thought was really cool is that the dead will carry it at the time a soul is weighed on the boat of the sun God. Um, and it's a sign that they are seeking immortality. So you can actually see the dead carrying it. And it's that they are seeking to be imparted with the immortality by the gods. Right. So it's kind of like, are they holding it or is the God holding it? Does that make sense? It tells you, is it being imparted or is it being sought? Yeah. Who hold, And who holds the key? I, you know, I do. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Who hold, yeah. who's physically holding it? Yeah. So you mentioned the girdle of Isis. Tell me about that. Oh yeah. The knot of Isis. Um, so the, the knot of Isis looks similar to what we, the modern Ankh. I shouldn't say modern. It's obviously very ancient, but it will throw up some pictures on the video and on the socials. And just in case anybody listening is not familiar with what a common Ankh looks like, but the knot of Isis is another symbol in Egyptian uh, mythology, ancient Egyptian mythology that looks very similar, except for, correct me if I'm wrong, that little T-bar is almost like folded down. It's not, isn't it slightly different in that way, but it has the knot at the top and then the, the, the say, so it's very similar to Some what people release, thought. Yes. Some people think it's, it's also re either related to, or it is another variation of the onk, but yes. the, knot, the knot of ISIS, I know, I know you'll be able to speak much more on this, but it's, it's definitely, a, I think, considered a symbol of protection specifically the knot of ISIS. So it, it's interesting because it is, it's a symbol of eternity, right? It's again, that same eternal uh, thing, but it's where you talking about like where the straight lines converge. Is that what you're talking about? Well, if I'm not mistaken, I was and looking at pictures down, of the knot of ISIS and that, that little, the bar 
but where the knots, the top loop sits on the onk, isn't that bar like either like truncated or folded down? Yeah, the, to the, the bar sides. Pot? Yes, to the sides. Yes, that's yes. what I'm trying to describe. So, and where it meets and in this, it's literally in the closed loop. And what's really cool about it is that it's really something it is. I mean, it can be a sign of protection because she is a protector, but it's really about your association with her because it ties back to the tree of life. Right. Right. So it is that eternal aspect. Right. What? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were giving me a look. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's in that, it's in that same category. I will say that because yes. there is a, a debate on whether or not it is because there's different interpretations of it some of them are bent down some are bent in some are right. there's a lot of different ways in which it's shown where um it's often it's so funny to me because every time I see you know the awareness ribbons for all different things cancer yeah, yeah. The loop it, of every everything. time I see that it uh -huh. reminds me of the um and oh, it reminds me specifically when you talk about the girdle or the the knot of Isis. Right. Um, the knots, though, are very specific as it relates to the Ankh. Do you know that about the Book of the Dead? I don't. I've read little oh, snippets, but oh. I want you, I know you, I want you to tell me. Okay. <laughs> so in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, it actually talks about life and immortality that we are tied down to the physical, right? Like we are tied to this material uh, plane of existence. And so in the Book of the Dead, it talks about freeing our, our binds, untying the knots of um, the Nephites or the neophytes. And so by untying ourselves, we are more free to be, again, not just the afterlife and eternity, but that immortality. Like, it's not just saying, like, untie yourself and you're going to die. You're going to go to the other world. But it's right. literally, like, to understand that you are immortal. If you can remove the constriction. How many times have you heard spiritual people, especially, like, in Buddhism, they cast off the possessions. And so when you cast off the things that keep you tied or bound to the physical world, you open yourself up to the immortal side of the soul. Right. So when you think about the um, uh, in some of the earlier depictions with the tie in the middle, right? It, it's kind of like the key to immortality is to untie the physical knots that we are constrained to this realm with. Oh, that's cool. See, I can't be what you said knots. I was like, oh yeah, she's going to talk about Book of the Dead. That's okay. What do you have oh, on knots though? Um, that's really all I had on the knots. <laughs> oh, well, see, then I'm going to go a little further because we talked about Buddhism. Yeah, get in naughty. Buddhism, <laughs> oh, oh Lord. I know. In Buddhism, they do have the Book of Untying Knots, which okay. corresponds very closely to the Egyptian Book of the Dead and untying yourself from the physical attributes that keep you bound to this world. Okay. That's what, really interesting. Buddhism and I do you know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah. a tie is that association between not and to the key. Yeah. That's very interesting to me. Very much. Do you have um I mean, I know you know some of the stuff that deals with knowledge and the mysteries, and in particularly Western mystery tradition, Hermetic Kabbalah. We talk about, uh, and I'm sure in Judaism they do in their Kabbalah version and Christians in their Kabbalah version because it's Hermetic Kabbalism is a, is a different, um, I'm not going to go into that debate. I, they are different for different reasons, whether it's spelled with a Q, K, or a C. But there is this, I've seen some people have, like, you know, those friendship bracelets. Do you remember those back in the day where you could tie the them thread? with the thread? Yes. 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 There are some that you, um, I've seen, and I don't know, I suspected they were either Buddhist they, and they may have had Egyptian beliefs or they were in some way associated with Western mystery tradition because you can wear a knotted bracelet. Uh -huh. And the point is to untie it once you, you release each knot, once you've released that thing. And the point is to rid yourself of the shackles on the wrist. Right. You like, you put it, you know what I'm saying? The knotted bracelet, yeah. and then you unknot that one off once you've kicked that habit or let go of that physical association. So it's literally like untying the knots 
that keep you shackled to the physical world, which shackles on the wrist. That's beautiful. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's really cool. So when I gift you a a friendship bracelet, just know that I'm shackling you to me. (laughs) I would be shackled to you forever, bestie. (laughs) Oh. So in Egypt, they have... um, the Ankh has actually been, so I know we talked about briefly whether or not we we're going to discuss this or not, but the Ankh, there are some people that believe that if you are not Black and you are not Indigenous to certain regions of Africa, particularly the Northern region up by the Maghreb and Egypt, that you should not wear the Ankh because Correct. it is a spiritual, religious belief. Um, and it would be like, you know, appropriating the cross if you're not a christian or appropriating you know the star of david if you're not jewish right and you know what i find interesting when i hear that is that coptic christians wear the ankh so and your coptic christians are your christians that are in egypt that's and they still are there um and they are persecuted widely which is unfortunate so it's, it's always interesting to me when I hear that, because I think of myself, well, the Coptic Christians have been using the Ankh for a very, very long time. Definitely. Um, and there's a lot of them that will actually use, because um, of course there's controversy on like Christianity using the cross when it's very similar to the Ankh, but you've got the loop missing from the top. Does that right. make sense? Like right. it's the same concept and did they really take it off and then you have people debate well if jesus is on the cross isn't his head the circle at the top right and so him on the cross is very onk symbolism looking so you know i'm not here to debate whether or not people or we're not here to debate whether or not you should or shouldn't use it but it's interesting to me when i hear that because i think of the coptic christians who have been using it for very 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 long time centuries upon centuries upon centuries yes and you know it it goes back even further than that because you have earlier depictions of it going back at least to 22 um the 22nd century bc Uh in sumeria and babylon but there it's depicted you know as what they call the rod and the ring are you familiar with that i'm not okay Oh, yeah. Well, back to there the we Coptic go. Christians for oh, one yeah. second. Um, just wanted to say, I saw off the throat, find the picture I found because it's a great example. There's some very old Catholic churches in Egypt um, that actually have these, you know, yeah. stone sculpture friezes that include very Catholic icon iconography with big old onks. Yes. So it's a really yeah. interesting, like you're talking about, like where they've been it's using that very as well in the Christian Catholic you know, religion there. For, yeah. And you have to think about uh, the context of when that came about, because you're talking about ancient Egypt, but then you're talking about the Hebrews who were there. And then you're talking about Judaism, which then rolls into Jesus. And Jesus was initially a Hebrew. So you, you know, he was Hebrew, but he was initially Jewish. Does that make sense? Like he yeah. identified as Jewish. He didn't identify as a Christian. People identified him. So that symbol has maintained its its power, really, for lack of a better word. Like it, it has power in and of itself because right. it's been used and particularly by so many people. Now, before I jump into the rod and the ring, one thing that is interesting because you you mentioned it, where there is a debate on whether or not it is a mirror. Right? Yes, yes, that's one okay. of the one of the hieroglyphic associations of it, and they the Egyptians were definitely used mirrors for divination, and also believed that life and death mirrored each other. So there, so there was a lot of symbology just with the concept of a mirror in Egypt, and there is debate on whether or not the Ankh. Um, also means literally mirror, not right. just life, but mirror. So it's interesting because you talk about like when I, when I heard that, I used to have an old school hand mirror. I don't know if they make them anymore because they're not as popular. But I remember like I had a a sterling silver hand mirror that I had gotten for like my thirteenth birthday or twelfth birthday. Something my grandmother sent, right? Like it had a whole like brush kit and all this, and I'm thinking this is fancy and I don't wear makeup or do you know what I'm saying? Like at the time, <laughs> yeah. but if you look at it, aside from the 
Whereas on a bar, right. it is shaped like a hand mirror. Right. So it's very interesting. Uh, and then that immediately takes you to John D, who had his scrying mirror, which is very interesting as well. Um, okay, so the rod and the ring. Let me jump. So the rod and the ring is predominantly it's Mesopotamia, Samaria. Um, now I'm sure you've seen it. So do you know the code of Hammurabi? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Wait, you cut out for one Robbie. second. Wait, we had a little, we had a little glitch. You, gl are you familiar? First. Are you familiar with the code of Hammurabi? Uh, and no. But, okay. okay, so that's where eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth comes from. Okay, that's actually where that's the first written law that we know of, right? Because uh, now I'm about to give you some background in in law. I mean, this is my oh, area. Boy. Criminal, criminal <laughs> yes, justice. It that's is. really where it, it, our first written, that's where it comes from, right. is the Code of Hammurabi. That's where we started seeing laws laid down, um, and at least in written form. And so if you look at the relief of the Code of Hammurabi, um, I, they call it a Stella, but on that he's holding, it's a circle with the uh, horizontal bar so it's just like what you would see the horizon with the sun but he's holding it in a way that his arm would be the bottom half of the arm oh does that make sense like the yeah. ball the it's up here and so that is a debate on whether or not that the egyptians derived it from the babylonians and the sumerians and that it is the original rod and ring it's also associated interestingly because you think of Code of Hammurabi, which is the king, but you think of Ishtar, which is a Babylonian queen uh, or goddess, the queen goddess, um, is associated with Isis. And she is depicted oftentimes holding two like this. And again, her forearm serves as the base or the bottom half of what would be the arm. Well, interestingly, also Ishtar and Isis are related to Venus. And Venus, the symbol for the planet Venus, which also kind of doubles as a symbol for the goddess Venus, looks very similar to the Ankh. It's not identical, but it's a very similar looking it's symbol as well. And so the symbol that you see with um, Venus, that is the rod in the ring. The only difference is that the horizontal line is sitting right up underneath that top uh, circle. Right. So it's very interesting the way that you see that progress. Yeah. I personally believe that it is the the predecessor of the Egyptian Ankh that we know. Does that make right. sense? I believe that's where it came from. Right. Um, there's so much that just ties into, and it's meaning being the same too. It's meaning means life there as well. So yeah. you have, do you know what I'm saying? Like it didn't change anything. It just looks a bit varied, but the Ankh has very um, different looks over time. Like the right. original one had two legs. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? And it the evolved the, so, as a and symbol. The, yes. And it was longer. And yeah. so things changed, which makes you think if it was longer, was it the forearm? Yeah. And when it became separated from the arm, it got shorter because right. now you don't need this long forearm. Well, and, and looking at the at Venus and Ishtar and all those got that goddess energy, bringing that into the picture, the, both of them in their different incarnations were goddesses of love, sexuality, fertility. Mm -hmm. And that kind of takes us back to that original possible meaning of the balancing of the masculine and feminine, because one of the literal interpretations is that top part that is the knot or that, you know, that circular yeah. part is the womb and that bottom dangly part is the dangle or the penis, <laughs> the dongle. <laughs> it's the, and so, and then those two are co combined, which creates life. Sexual union yeah. creates life. So like, so where the onk represents life and the breath of life and life force the masculine and feminine coming together. I, it's just, again, it's one of those, uh, what do you call that again? What do you call that thing that, oh boy, with the arm. Link analysis. Link analysis. I keep picturing mm, the link analysis. Yeah. It all starts to tie together from all it, these different cultures. I mm, and it does, it goes back to, again, the microcosm and the macrocosm. It, it's very much that creative process. It is life and death. You cannot have life without some form of death and regeneration and rebirth. And it's, that's why it's also so associated with funerary rites and death and darkness and underworld, which that is, that also opens up the door to it being the key to the mysteries, right. the key to understanding, you know, hidden knowledge. And that comes through 
either literal death and, and being quote unquote on the other side, which the other side ain't the other side, it's here, but that's a whole other story. Um, or, you know, the metaphorical death of the ego that then allows you to see the immortal side of the soul and life. So it's very interesting. Um, you know, there's, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little bit off track. There's okay. an episode of, of golden girls. Ah, I love it. I'm already. a golden girls fan. <laughs> um, there's an episode of golden girls where Blanche, uh, or not Blanche. I'm sorry. Sophia pretends to die and host her funeral and so they like send out, I guess, you know, death announcements and invitations for the funeral and all that. And um, Rose was supposed to put on there like she's not actually dead or whatever. It's just like a mock funeral because she's not going to be here to enjoy it once she is passed, whatever. Well, Rose didn't put it out there. And so Sophia comes in and everybody's crying. You know, they think Sophia's dead. All the friends and family are there, whatever. And so it's very much about, you know, if you see the onk, it's not just removing yourself or liberating yourself or letting things go to for that that in you know that insider knowledge that understanding that mysteries that immortality, but I think some of us would benefit from a quote unquote metaphorical death yes. and to look from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because it was interesting to see you know some people had you know like smart remarks like of course you would do this Sophia you know how could you do this and she didn't mean for people to think she was actually dead do you know what I'm saying right but it's one of those and there's plenty of other stories out there where people have faked their deaths and then you know realize you know people found out they were alive still or people showed up and hosted their own funerals it's very interesting to me if you use it in a way that is not just um, lackadaisical, like, oh, yeah, this is like a, a sign for life and key and understanding. But if you could use that symbol in, in terms of intentionally letting things die away in order to give birth, rebirth, analysis, evaluation to. Does that make sense? To it give does. consideration. Um and I'm not saying go out and plan your fake funeral because if I get a death <laughs> notice and funeral invite, I'm going to be livid. But I mean, it, it's literally like, think about that. Think about what that could mean for you if you embrace the power of the um, yeah. the breath of true life, the liberation, the untying of the knots from the physical to see things before it's your literal passing. Does that make sense? It does. That's deep too. Oof. I love it. What can I say? I'm a, I'm a philosopher. You're a philosopher. I love it. I'm a philosophizer. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, I will say there is one aspect of our society that has started to do that, but I think it's, and I'm probably going to rattle um, some feathers here or ruffle some feathers, but that's okay. But you see the onk used pretty heavily with the vampire culture. I was just going to say, I have a whole bunch and, about and, vampire and culture. Yes. Yeah, and, and goths. Um, and I'm not knocking that. And I do think some of them, I think some of them is a genuine thing, right? Like they understand the metaphorical death. They understand the, the shadow side, the darker work, the what comes after. But I also think it's like, Oh my God, I'm wearing an on oh, big look at me. There's a it's lot trendy. of trendy. It's really trendy. Trendy. It mm -hmm. is. It's super trendy. And people don't understand the ramifications of a symbol that is this ancient. Right. That is this impressed and powerful in what we call the egregore, which is the magical current that exists through everything um, in time and space. We give power to things, and that power builds up over time that it's used. And when you think of a symbol like this that has been used in magic and funerary rites, um, religious rites as well that's not something that I would just slap on my body because it goes with my outfit today. Yeah. It's not a willy nilly. Let me just wield a, an onk. You need to know what you're, what you're playing with. It's a, yeah. it's a heavy hitter. Yeah. I, and that's, and I'm interested to hear what you have on vampire uh, culture because I mean, it is, and vampire culture has become really popular, right? Like it's it gotten is. even more it popular. Um, yeah. I mean, we went from Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt to, vampires that sparkle like diamonds in the sunshine like things have definitely changed <laughs> a bit um do you know what i'm saying yeah. like yeah it's, it's a bit different um and again i'm not knocking it i just 
I think that if you're going to use it or wear it, you should know what it means. Absolutely. And you understand that regardless if it, it is imbued with, you know, anything, it automatically carries a resonance because of what it is, because it's been used for millennia, because yeah. it's been an egregore. It is a powerful, potent uh, amulet is, is what yeah. it is. And it so, carries an energy. There's an energy it, to what, what you're, I'm saying. what it's, you're donning. It's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah the, apparently the, now I had not heard of this movie. Have you heard of the movie, The Hunger? It's mm -hmm. from 1983, no. which is probably why I hadn't heard of it before, because in 1983, I was a little too young to be watching Vampire. I wasn't born movies. yet. Oh, well, I was, girl, but I was only nine. Gosh, that really dates me. Anyway, but I was too young to be seeing like adult, <laughs> adult movies, because this is a definitely an R, very R-rated. But it's got David Bowie and Susan Sarandon, a very young Susan Sarandon. Oh. And I was like, I love David Bowie. So I was like, how yeah. have I never heard of this movie? And I did watch part of it. The only reason I, I didn't finish it is because I can only watch movies in like pieces because I watch like an hour at a time at night and then I fall asleep. <laughs> so that's my own issue. But it was really yeah. intriguing. It's a very sexualized movie. Very, It's about vampires. And um, they use, the onk is very prevalent in the movie. They have this whole, and apparently there's a whole, I don't know if I want to say a cult, but there's a whole following of like you said, vampire culture is very popular, but there's, there's different sets of vampire culture, yeah. different, like, you know, clans. denominations. Yes. Denominations, clans, Sorry. just like anything else, system structure. Yeah. And there's a whole offshoot that seems to have come directly from this movie. And this movie really, in some ways has been credited for really associating the Ankh really heavily with vampire culture. In the movie they have, the main character has an Ankh that actually is tapered at the end, like a little blade. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. what they use to slice open and drink the blood. Yeah. And so if you think of like blood is life and the Ankh being mm -hmm. a symbol of life and that life essence. So, and then even the immortality factor, because the Ankh is very representative of immortality, which vampire culture and vampire concept is. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's a specific onk you can find that has that little, it's still sold. It's very popular as a little amulet. Mm -hmm. It has the, it's the full onk, but with a little blade, little sharp, little blade to cut. Yeah, I have, I have the necklace of, it is a cross with the dagger end. Um, but it has a different, it's not the complete loop at the top, right? Um, but it's actually, uh, it's from James Avery. Oh, really? It's Jewish. It's a Jewish symbol. Huh. Interesting. That's a whole topic for another day. I think we need yeah. to do a topic on vampirism. Yeah. Oh, we do. And blood. Do. Yeah. And blood. blood, and blood yes. And yes. Yes. Blood. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm um, an old which... school Anne Rice reader. So long before, oh. long before Interview with a Vampire, the movie, I used to read the books. I love, love, love. I have not read Rice. the books. Um, I, I'm actually not even a big fan of, of Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise. I never really was. The movie, but was, I oh. liked, but <laughs> I liked the movie. I think predominantly because of the time that it's set in, the, yes. the, the structure, the storyline, all of that. Um, but like I said, now we have vampires that sparkle. We do, so, and they're sensitive, <laughs> and they're so they sweet, are. and they're vegetarians. They're yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely different. I mean, I'm down for like some underworld. I love the underworld movies. Yes. Those are, those are yes. wicked. But um, with that being said, I think that if you are somebody that is interested in wearing an onk, I don't, I don't see it as any form of, you know, harm in terms of cultural appropriation or anything like that. I personally don't see it that way. But I think people need to be aware of what it means um, yes. and what you are embodying when you put it on your body and that it's not just a, hey, look at me, like I've got this symbol because again, people like to wear, particularly younger folks, like to wear symbols that they think are going to have shock value, um, you know. Or oh, coolness gonna, factor. <laughs> yeah, coolness and shock yeah. value. And, and so there is, um, I you know this, my... Saying this, but I'm going to say it. Wiser Publishing is my. Uh, I love things done by Wiser Publishing House. They are I, I just up my alley of the type of things that I like to learn, um, and in depth knowledge, secret knowledge, esoteric into the mysteries. And their logo is yeah. the Ankh. I was just going to say so, I, that logo. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, it's very, yeah. and that is what it is. Cause it, again, yeah. it is that into the mysteries and to the depth that, you know, death of the untying of the knot of the physical and diving into the depths of the immortal into the soul and to right. the, the mysteries. So, and are you, do you know, Andrea Fertick? She's yes. the Afro goddess. Okay. Yeah, so have her. you seen, yeah. have you seen her Nova? Oh my God. Yes. I love the Nova doll. Have you love. seen Nova's Have you? Seen, okay. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Andrea Fertick is a, uh, you know, in Hattie, she's a creatress. That's what she is. She has Afro goddess tarot deck. She has, uh, you know, all these different Oops. things. She's an amazing yeah. artist, right? So her, type of art is not normally something I would gravitate to, but I actually ended up really liking it because of her composition. It's unique. It's not my type of classical art, but it's something, it, there's just something about it, right? And then when you get to know her, it's that magical side. It's like, oh, okay. So she's a root worker um, and she's in, I believe Atlanta is where she's out of. I think you're right. But, yes. So she created or is in the process of bringing Nova to life. Now I met her a little over a year ago at the international divination event in 2022. And we got caught into a conversation and we started talking about, she ended up telling me about Nova, which is her African and Af, not African American, African doll to, to basically honor her roots and the ancestral magic from Africa. And her name is Nova, and there's actually several of them. I think she's just going to go with Nova at this point is where she's at. Uh, Nova may be hitting toy stores near you. Um, I'm not sure. I I've seen like, so. I've, I've been hitting too. like little parts of like, I've been catching yeah. little things that's happening. Like she's been at toy conventions and stuff like that. Right. But anyways, Nova is imbued with the four elements um, and she has different spiritual tools. And this is like a mainstream doll is what they're looking at. And now she's going to have a line of other products like purses and clothes and all this that's around Nova. But Nova's symbol is the Ankh. Yes. Did you notice that? I did her, notice her, that. Her yes. necklace and her belt. And yeah, it's very, yeah. it's interesting because you have the four, she has Nova with the four elements and then the fifth element, which is traditionally spirit. So you have fire, you have water, you have uh, wind or air, and then you have earth. And then the fifth element is always spirit. Yes. So Nova is spirit and she's carrying and wearing the Ankh, which is just to me amazing. And it does perfection. have that African. Yeah, it is that perfection. And it has that African association because that's where we see this come out of it is the crescent, the cradle of civilization, right? which is just magic in and of itself. So I'm going to plug Andrea here because um, I think people really need to jump on. If this is up your, your alley of things that you like, um, the Nova stuff is actually pretty cool. I like to see that she's doing something magical with a toy, which it is a toy, but it is also a tool. I was going to look up what her exact social is, if that, so we can plug it's, her it's, properly. It's the Afro, the uh, Afro goddess connection her name, the afro yeah. goddess connection and it's andrea fertick and mm -hmm. she i would definitely uh get into her yeah so it maybe we can ask her permission but we can add to the video and the socials a picture oh, of nova because she's gorgeous yeah. yeah she's really freaking cool i just pulled up the social too and yeah. it that's it, you should know you should know andrea you should be in her world and you should know nova yes. and um Again, you know, it's it's interesting where you see this on again that mysteries, that in depth, that immortality. I I love it. Do you own an onk? Do you ever wear an onk? I don't wear an onk. Um, I feel like it's it's not that I don't. What am I trying to say? It's it is so potent that I respect the power of it, and I don't want to wear it too willy nilly. I'm very careful about what symbols and icons I wear on my body. Yeah, I and have it, it's one. almost like I'm not sure I'm it's almost a humble I'm not sure I'm not worthy that's not a good word for it it You're just feels worthy, like Jen. I'm not worthy um you, you know what I mean like no, it's almost it's, like it's, it's so yeah. powerful of a symbol that I respect and, and admire that power and I want to always be careful I'm not just like I'm gonna wear me an onk I I don't yeah, know yeah I, I think it's a it's a a genuine appreciation and showing respect. I have yes. one that um, very rarely gets pulled out. It's not a necklace or anything, but it's it's an altar piece oh, that gets pulled nice. out. And so it's kind of like one of those, depending on 
when it's needed, um, if I need to pray with it or, or meditate and, and step into, but it it very rarely comes out again because it's a symbol that has been built up for millennia at this point. Um, and it's in that symbolism is in the egregore. It carries a resonance whether you know it or not. So it's it's something to be to marvel at, but also show respect to. Agreed. And I of all the symbols we've covered so far, you know, any of the animal spirits, any of the animal symbology, there there's lots and lots of depth there too. But this is very different. It's a very different powerhouse of a symbol that is it's not an identifiable animal creature, you know, little yeah. critter or a flower or a plant. It's a very specific, I mean, it is a true symbol of more, yeah. even more so than the other itself, symbologies yeah. we've talked about. So you really yeah. have to, yeah, I agree with that. You have to have to reverence be, for it. Reverence is, yeah. I think, a good word for and, it. And it's interesting because when you think of the Ankh, especially when it had the two legs, it's very much looks like the, you know, the Vitruvian man, or if we were to stand there and, right. you know, spread our arms and our legs out. So it is very much about you. I think it's a wonderful symbol if you wanted to work with it for like alchemical work or, you know, again, untying the knots that bind you. Yes. Um, and I really want to read. I'd love to get my hands on the Buddhism uh, or the Buddhist book on the book of unt untying knots. I'd like to actually read it, not just know about it. I'd like to see what yeah. it says in there. And I'm going to send you a friendship bracelet that has not so you can Aww. start like sure. untying the things that bind <laughs> you to this world. I need to untie some binding. Well, you know, the, except for the fun ones. Um, <laughs> a little also, devil there. I also think even though, like you said, there are other cultures besides Egypt that this does originate from. Oh, yeah. yeah but yeah. I feel like it is probably most accepted as an Egyptian symbol, you know, yeah. as far as cultural acceptance. And yeah. I think on a very base level if you're seeing the Ankh a lot it could literally be beckoning you to dig more into Egyptian research Egyptian study um Egyptian travel I mean there could there's all those things I literally think that come in that crescent yeah you know, it's calling you to something and it could be that you had a past life in Egypt and maybe it's like trying to kind of remind you of that gently you know there's a lot of that Egyptian tie there that I think it yeah. could be n nudging you towards if you see it yeah and I, I here's one thing i am going to say that's probably a little controversial i want people to be really cognizant if you try and go down the past life thing um there's a lot of charlatans out there charging an excessive amount of money to do past life regression work who have no training um and i'm actually not somebody that does um a lot of past life stuff i'm of the mindset of i have work to do here in this lifetime so i try not to delve too deep into anything else because it could be traumatic or whatever but it doesn't mean that it's showing up isn't a hey you might want to pay attention and like my master teacher likes to say it's time to remember oh yes yes so there's certain things that we remember and you may not know why you remember what you remember but you remember it nonetheless and usually it's to serve you and whatever's going on in your path in this mm -hmm. lifetime if you're actually having yeah. something nudge you and strong enough from that that's it. Yeah, it's really cool. They just did, the Lodge did a trip to Egypt in December and I wanted to go so bad. They were there for almost like two weeks and I was like, oh, if I could do that price tag, I would go. Girl, and I'm those actually. Would be the, those would be the people I would go with too, yeah. because they're the ones that actually study it. It's not yes. just, let's go have a tourism type thing. It's a reverence for the culture and the, where, where we came from. I know there's a lot of debate on where civilization started. I think most people are in agreement now scientifically that we came out of Africa. Oh, I would yes. hope. Is yes. there anything I would hope that people could recognize that? Um, right. Team, team Anunnaki. Uh, so it seems, <laughs> <laughs> it's again, it's it's in that that realm of just deep appreciation for um, yeah. and pay attention to it. And if it shows up, yeah, it could be calling you to untie knots. It could be calling you uh, as a key to unlocking something within yourself, to dive into the mysteries, to to teachings, whether that's religious or spiritual uh, or just historical studies. Yeah. And you could always watch Ancient Aliens. You know? <laughs> That sends you down rabbit you holes. You and I your mean, ancient you, aliens. <laughs> I know. It starts you, though. It does. It starts you on this rabbit hole where it does, they don't give you all the details. Anybody who's wise enough, who's a true seeker, takes the information you see in those episodes, and then you start doing your own research, and you start digging, and then you're like, I think analysis. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, that's that's your yarn. Yeah, wait, I'm serious. So we're going to have to, I'm going to have to post a picture. You're going to have to post the name of the guy doing the analysis so that I refer (laughs) to it or you refer to it. People know what you're talking about. Um, I'll see if I can find a link analysis with crime data. And so they can compare. That's what we're talking about. My crime data analysis and his, which is the same thing as what he's doing. Yeah. Well, that's all I have on the onk because in itself, like you said, it is a symbol. It's not just a thing that can have symbolic meaning. It is a symbol that uh, is very deep, but very concise at the same time. Definitely. So is that all you have, my dear? Yeah, I had some pop culture stuff. It's just because it's oh. interesting to see all the big time, big name stars that have used onks in their music videos or on their body. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we kind of somewhat touched on that. We don't necessarily have to name drop. The, the funniest to me, which is not to go back into the appropriation thing, but if there was appropriation, Ace of Bass. You know, oh. that song, I yeah. saw, the, saw sign. the sign. When we yes. were first starting this venture, that would play over and over when I would teach at karate, it would come up on the random playlist and I'd be like, why is this? This Because, you know, that's what we were talking about. Signs, symbols, seeing the signs. And I do actually like that song. It's cheesy, but apparently in that music video, they flash onks all over the place. And I didn't know, I don't know if I've ever seen a music video. And I had to laugh. I'm like, because I think the bass is a very, a very white bass. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm like, okay, all right. And, uh, you know. That's interesting. interesting, I'm going to have to go watch that. Yeah. That, so Ace of Base and that song in particular. So, you know, my former husband is deceased. Yes. That is one of his favorite bands when he was growing up. And that song, which if you knew him, was way off the cuff of anything that he listened to. Like we're talking to somebody that listened to, you know, Swisher House and Biggie and Tupac yeah. and Fat Pat. And then you've got he's listening to ace of bass apparently i this was something his sister ended up telling me oh that's um, funny after we got married she was like the song had come on and she was like you know that this is his favorite song for the longest time she used he used to play this over and over and over and i'm like what and she's five years younger than him yeah so yeah that's interesting i'm gonna have to check that out i didn't know yeah. that. Isn't that i don't think i've ever seen the video and if i have it would have been 20 something years ago on whenever it came out Right. Back I when definitely... MTV showed actual music videos. Right. You were you weren't I... even born when they showed music videos, were you? <laughs> I was. I was born. I was oh, born. Good, good, good. <laughs> oh. Well, with that, we bid you adieu. This is the conclusion of episode six. Thank you all so uh-huh. much for listening. Thank yes, you. we appreciate you. Make sure to check out the socials. Uh, we're gonna get to drop in images on there starting with probably um the link analysis so that we you know what we're talking about when we keep talking about this meme with the guy with the cigarette hanging out of his mouth and me talking about crime analysis so yes absolutely well we appreciate you for listening and watching us and we are wishing you a wonderful rest of your day thank you bye